All right, well, thank you, Linnell, and uh, it sounds like our, our uh, audio is working, so we're all set. Um, hello to our streaming audience and to folks that are going to be watching this at some future date. Uh, I hope that in the future when you're watching this, you did not double park your flying car. <laughs> I felt like there should be a joke about the future. I don't know. Maybe that wasn't the right one. All right, so I'm going to talk about the Enhanced Juvenile Justice Guidelines. And I really feel like I should have named it differently because it doesn't have like a clever acronym. And I was trying to decide, like, how can I make it say egg instead? Like, extra good guidelines for juvenile justice. And then I could say, do you have the egg? But unfortunately, we have enhanced juvenile justice guidelines. So as Lionel said, my name is Jessica Pierce. I work for the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges as a senior site manager. And what that means is that a large part of my job is actually to go out to courts and uh, work with jurisdictions on jurisdiction level issues and help your judges and um, all of your teams and yourselves make changes to practice. And that's kind of my job. Now, the National Council, we're a sister organization to NACOM. And uh, I was thinking about this a lot. Our conference is next week. And so for all of you that work with juvenile and family court judges, next week is when they're gonna come to our conference. Then they're gonna come home and tell you all of the things they want to change <laughs> based on what they learned at our conference, right? Uh, so that's, yeah, we're the people who work with the juvenile and family court judges. And they really drive what we do because they're, we're a membership organization. And so they come to us and they kind of tell us what they would like to be seeing in reforms, where they'd like us to look for funding, and what they'd like us to do. Now, because we're sister organizations, we actually have a joint membership with NACOM. And so if you're interested at all in joining the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, I would heartily recommend it. Um, and even if you don't join, uh, you can still call on us for training and technical assistance. So we have federal grants that deal with everything that happens in juvenile and family court. Today I'm talking about juvenile delinquency, but we also have funding to provide assistance for school justice issues, for child abuse and neglect issues, for domestic violence issues. And so if you're thinking, we really could use training on child sex trafficking, but I don't know where to go for that, we have money for that. You could call us, we could come out and offer you a training for that. So think of us as a resource, not just for your judges, but also for you. Um, a lot of times your judges will be the ones who will um, uh, institute that, right? They'll say, call the National Council and see if they can do something. But you don't have to wait for your judges to ask for that. You can just call us directly. So we're gonna talk today about the Enhanced Juvenile Justice Guidelines. And the reason it's called Enhanced is because this is an update to a publication that came out in 2003, the Juvenile Delinquency Guidelines. Does anybody have the juvenile delinquency guidelines sitting on their shelves at home? Yes, yay. Couple of folks, you guys over here, you have the, the delinquency guidelines. So this came out in 2003 and you can see it, it's a big book. We really were into Marvel covers back at the time so it's, it's got that look to it. It's about 500 pages spiral bound. It was a lot and uh, so we really wanted as juvenile justice changed, we wanted our book to change too. So actually now it's only available online, but I asked for a new cover anyway. So now it looks like this. Uh, and we call it the Enhanced Juvenile Justice Guidelines instead of the Enhanced Delinquency Guidelines because we really want to shift thinking about kids that come into court, right? Delinquency feels a little bit like we're labeling and that we're really focusing on the negative aspects of the young person and so we decided to go with juvenile justice guidelines. So this is the part where we get interactive. I know it's early in the morning. Folks were out late last night, maybe. Did anybody go to see O here at the Bellagio? It looks so cool from those flyers and the posters in the, the building. I was like, maybe I should have stayed an extra night. Well, I'm glad you're here. So this is, I'm gonna ask this question, what do you think is the most important in juvenile court case processing. And I want folks to, to give me your thoughts on this. And Lionel's gonna come with the microphone. I know it's a lot of pressure with the microphone. Justice. 
I, I'm hearing accuracy from this side of the, the room. Tell me more about what you mean by accuracy. Oh, I was thinking more what's in the court documents rather than the processing. What's but in the court documents? Well, I think you're totally right, though, mm -hmm. right? That we need to have good information about the kids and families that we're working with. Otherwise, we can have mistakes. And time, time, timeliness. Timeliness, absolutely. So when we think about kids and we think about how kids learn, and well, really grown-ups too, we know that being able to have a consequence follow an action in a timely way is really, really important. We want kids to be able to go, I did this, then this happened, and attach those two things together. That's hard to do if somebody does something in April and doesn't see the judge until August or September, and it creates all of this chaos in their lives. The kid has forgotten entirely about what happened. Their parents forgot until they get in front of the judge, and then they get mad all over again. So it creates this chaos. So this idea of timeliness and being immediate is great. What else? We've got a hand over here. Confidentiality. Confidentiality. Yeah, confidentiality used to kind of just be baked into juvenile justice. We used to have closed hearings, and then when people were really like, what's happening with those kids? We're not sure that you're doing the right thing. We started to open up our courts, and that's created a whole bunch of confidentiality issues that we maybe didn't have to deal with 10, 15, or 20 years ago. So how do we ensure confidentiality while still making sure that we're serving both the public and our youth? Great one. What else? Good morning. Good morning. Trust and caring. Trust and caring, yeah. So if we think about what we're supposed to be doing in juvenile court, punishment isn't it, right? Juvenile court was created back in 1899 with the idea that our kids commit crimes for different reasons and also that our kids are not fully formed that they're malleable and that we have an opportunity to intervene and help them change what they're doing. That's hard to do when they see you as the enemy. So creating that trust with the young person so they feel like they want to engage in what we're doing is really important. At the same time, we have to keep the public trust, right? Because they expect us to keep them safe. And if I had a prosecutor in the room, they'd be the first person to raise their hand and remind me of that. So it is, it's a, it's a balancing act, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, collaboration with our justice partners. Yes, I collaboration. Think um, I think out of all of the court systems, juvenile and family court lends itself to collaboration the very best because our goals are different. We want to work with our kids and families. We want to help them develop skills and competencies. We want our parents to grow as people and and develop skills and competencies there. So it's really important that we're always all working together and we think about how different agencies can complement each other. Um, I work a lot with juvenile drug treatment courts and so a lot of times we're talking about blending what's happening in substance abuse treatment with what's happening in probation because those folks have the same goals but are going about it a little bit differently and so how do they work together and talk together to make sure they reach their outcomes? Collaboration. Anybody else have a thought? Yes, sir. Moving from adequate services to excellent services. Adequate to excellent on our services. Yeah, it can feel like we put kids into um, services or we recommend them for services because that's what we have and maybe it'll work and good luck. And so how can we make sure that we're really matching kids to what they need and how are we figuring that out we're going to talk a lot um, a little bit later on about risk and need assessment and using those instruments to really figure out what kids um, are going to keep committing crimes how we can place kids in the right services and how we can really match their needs to um, to their outcomes anything else all right so you guys are in the right place then this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about juvenile court and how it can work better. The enhanced juvenile justice guidelines are a really interesting mix of kind of the philosophical and then the practical. Uh, the, the original book was organized chronologically. So it kind of started from 
what do you do at that you know, initial hearing? And then what do you do at the detention hearing? How do you follow up? Um, what do you do when kids are out you know, on probation? And so it is organized chronologically. And there are recommendations for all kinds of things, like who should attend those uh, hearings? How do you make sure you notify folks? And, and really practical things. And at the same time, there's a lot of that philosophy about why we think juvenile court is different than a trial court. So the history of the juvenile justice guidelines, the enhanced juvenile justice guidelines, starts in 1899 with the founding, no, I'm kidding. Um, the enhanced juvenile justice guidelines came from the delinquency guidelines. We started the juvenile delinquency guidelines in 2000. And I should tell you um, that I was around when that happened. Um, I started working at the National Council in 1995, um, and I was, I was young. I was just out of preschool. <laughs> um, but I was just out of college, and I was thinking about attending pharmacy school. And pharmacy school seemed like a way I could help people and use my chemistry skills, and it would be useful, but not like blood and guts doctor useful. Um, so it seemed like maybe a good fit, but I also had heard being a pharmacist was both stressful and boring. And that seemed like a terrible combination. So I was trying to decide what to do, and I got a job as a temp working at the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. And I instantly was fascinated by this idea of justice reform, that we could change the world and change people's lives by changing how the system worked. And so I thought, well, I'll hang out here for a while and, and then decide what I want to do. And then I, I never left because we haven't finished changing the world, right? So we have to keep doing this. But it is, it's important work and it's necessary. And I think for those of you who've worked at, at your um, courts for a while, you know that we need to keep pushing and changing things. We need to make sure that we are serving our kids and our families and our communities in the very best possible way. So I fell in love with the work and, uh, and so I've just continued to develop skills um, as I've gone along. I've tried to learn as much as I can. I became an expert in things like adolescent development, um, which is handy because now I have a 14 year old. Um, so uh, that's why she's not locked in her room right now. Um, you know, kids are hard and working with kids when they're not your own, that's even harder. And I say I admire very much all of those folks, all of, all of you and especially our judges who are on the bench, who are hearing these things that are happening in these kids and families' lives and are there, they're making decisions, and they're trying as best they can to do that with very little training. You know, law school does not have a really big family law track. It's not prestigious like other things. It's hard work. You guys are doing hard things. And so it seems to me that our job as a technical assistance provider then is to make your lives a little easier because you're doing the hard thing, right? Ours is an easy lift. I make PowerPoints, I get to talk to people, I observe court, but I don't have to be there directly. I don't have the stress that you guys have of running the court and dealing with the politics and the money issues and wrangling the judges, right? That's a lot. And so how can we make your lives easier? That's why we create things like the Enhanced Juvenile Justice Guidelines, to make the lives of practitioners better. Now, the Enhanced Juvenile Justice Guidelines um, actually came after we created our very first publication, which was the Resource Guidelines. Those were for the handling of child abuse and neglect cases, dependency cases. We did that because the Adoption and Safe Families Act was passed. And all of a sudden, courts were looking at us to say, we have these timelines that we're locked into. We don't know what to do to get families either reunified or terminate parental rights. We really need some help. And so we started in um, like 1996 creating the enhanced resource guidelines for dependency cases. And when we finished those, we thought, huh, there really aren't guidelines for how any of this should work. We as a national judicial organization are well placed to create the uh, guidebook for delinquency as well. So we brought together a whole bunch of people. We brought court administrators, judges, experts from the field, um, probation officers, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and uh, spent three years talking with them and looking at the research. And that's where the original delinquency guidelines came in. Then 
we came out and we trained folks on it. We had courts that were model courts. Uh, we were out in the field. We did a lot of presentations like this. And then the money went away. In 2008, we ran out of money. And so courts that had adopted the guidelines, great. They were operating like they should and everything was good. But we had no way to help push courts further. And we were kind of just waiting for an opportunity. And as we were waiting, things changed, right? So even at the time that we were writing the delinquency guidelines in 2003 is when they were finally published, even as we were doing that, things were changing in juvenile justice because all of a sudden people were interested in research in juvenile justice where they hadn't been before. Uh, we suddenly had instruments like risk and need assessment instruments that were still kind of in their infancy, infancy in the 1990s and were suddenly kind of fully formed. We had huge Supreme Court cases that came out that agreed with us, right? We, as, uh, as an organization, always, always campaigned against uh, death penalty for kids, solitary confinement for kids, lifetime imprisonment for kids. Uh, we also, you know, campaign against other things like shackling for kids. For the most part, our youth are just not that high risk, and we recommend against it. So we have all of these opportunities then to change the publication. And uh, we were very lucky uh, three years ago that the State Justice Institute gave us some money to start this. And the thing that I think that we did that, that I'm most excited about is that we created this as an online resource now. You don't have to have that 500 page ugly book on you. <laughs> and you can search and I can link you to all of the other things that you need to know about juvenile justice. So I'm really excited about it. Um, and I hope that it becomes a more useful tool for all of you. Um, the audience for the, the Enhanced Juvenile Justice Guidelines is both folks working in the court and also court administrators like you guys, because you can help set the policies that reinforce some of this. But also, if you have a, somebody who's new to the juvenile bench and you want to help them get up to speed, something like this is a really handy tool. This tells them, walks them through what juvenile court is all about. If you have a new probation officer, this is a great tool because it again, talks to them about what juvenile court is all about. A new prosecutor, this is what juvenile court is all about. All right, so what do you think has changed the most in the last 15 years since we originally published these guidelines? Actually, this was from 2018, so it's technically been 16 years since we published uh, the original delinquency guidelines. And Lionel has the microphone ready. You don't think anything has changed? Oh, good. You mentioned shackling in mm -hmm. detention hearings. Um, I'm not sure what the guidelines said in 2003, but that's changed. It's changed it has changed, us. absolutely. So. And we have more research on those things now. One of the things that happened in 2003 is we were a little bit hesitant about what to say because we, we felt like it was the right thing, but we didn't necessarily, couldn't necessarily prove it. And so we had to walk that line between being um, prescriptive and recommending practice and um, in avoiding things that we couldn't really back up. So absolutely, that's changed. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, um, I think a greater awareness of the uh, brain development. Yes. Uh, that has been a huge focus on, on, on that particular process and how it affects the kids and, and what they can and cannot do because of that. Absolutely. We know a lot more about adolescent development, how the adolescent brain works, and how kids make decisions. And so that information really should be driving and informing all of the things that we're doing in juvenile court, absolutely. That from an administrative perspective, I feel that there's more of a team approach on how we handle our juvenile cases. Administratively, we're more involved in the discussions um, about how we're gonna process cases and additional training for court staff, almost like a specialty court, um, at least in my, my county. Yeah, I think thinking about juvenile court is almost like a specialty court is a great idea. When drug courts first came out and they were talking about being collaborative and, and uh, you know, really focusing on building on strengths and uh, 
reducing risk factors. We were like, isn't that what juvenile court's supposed to do anyway? This feels like the problem solving movement really is a perfect fit for juvenile court because that's what we want anyway. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, in, our, in our system, we have a statewide system. We've seen a, a, a greater push to limit uh, even bringing juveniles into the courtroom at all, far more diversion. Programs. Absolutely. We know from research that most kids do not need us. We want to give them things when they come to us, right? We're like, yay, you're here. Stay and take, take advantage of our services. But for the most part, crime is a young person's game. And kids age out of most of this behavior. And there's some good research uh, that indicates that kids that are on the same trajectories, the ones that get caught and the ones that don't, basically end up at the same place in the end anyway. So keeping kids who don't need to come to court out of court, so that means that probably you're dealing with kids now who are maybe more serious offenders, right? Because we wanna make sure we're keeping that public safety side of things in mind. And also those more serious offenders are more likely to need more things and more likely to continue on their trajectory of, of criminal behavior. So that's absolutely. And I think for us, and it may have been covered in what the gentleman just said, but a, the quality of, of the hearings themselves, the amount of information that's available, whether it is on brain development or trauma-informed decisions, just the amount of information that is available when you make the decisions about the juveniles has substantially increased. And for us, the uh, array of services that are provided, including diversion, which somebody mentioned, has really expanded over these years. And so I think Absolutely. those two things, and the quality of their representation, and all of our, I assume everywhere, all of our juveniles are represented, you know, appointed counsel. That, that's one of our guidelines. So I'm very happy they have a, uh, appointed counsel. Yeah, so I think there was a lot there. The idea that, um, that we have better information, we have better services to send kids to. We know more about how we think this should work. Um, and so it's much, much easier, I think, um, and for those of you that have been doing this for a while, you'll have to tell me, but I feel like it's, it's easier to process and work with those kids now, even if we are working with kids that are kind of further along in their, their crime and delinquency, than it would have been 10 years ago because we have this access. So I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Simply changing from delinquency, the label or stigma of delinquency to juvenile justice. Yes. I think that's been very helpful. Yeah, um, I think this whole idea of person first language and the uh, person first language is we say instead of saying a drug addict, we say a person with substance use issues, right? So instead of giving somebody kind of a label, instead of calling a kid a delinquent, we say a young person who has committed delinquent acts. And we think about them as kind of resources and rational actors within their own lives. And that means that the way we deal with them necessarily has to change because we're not really there to just kind of put them in time out for a couple of days and then let them go. We're there to help them develop competencies. We're there to help them learn how to think. We're the, when we think about the adolescent brain, when we think about brain development, we know that the brain develops from the back to the front. And the front is where all of the command center is, right? That's where our decision making happens. I think probably everybody has heard that statistic now that um, the brain doesn't completely finish maturing until 25, 26, in boys even a little bit later than that. So all of those decisions you made in your early 20s, you can just blame your brain. Just be like, I had an adolescent brain then, I don't know why I was dating that drummer. It's just how it works, right? All right, I saw a hand over here too. I appreciate you guys being patient with the microphone. Yeah. Um the, the recognition that um, some of the kids in the system are in both the child welfare and the juvenile justice system. So there has definitely been, at least in, in our area, growing recognition and work on that. Yes, yeah, so we have kids that cross over, and maybe they're not crossed over at this moment in time, but that very likely sometime in their past they had maybe uh, child welfare contact. And so that idea that, that there are um, other issues that we're gonna need to address when we see that delinquent kid in front of us, it used to just be, right, that we were dealing with that delinquent youth and we're gonna make sure that he or she, mostly he, gets on the right path 
And we're gonna do that by locking him up because he's gonna, that's gonna be a wake up call. Maybe we're gonna send him to a boot camp because that's gonna give him discipline. But we don't think about all those other things that are happening. We don't think about those kids living in their family systems. We don't think about that they, if we send them to boot camp, and how many times have I heard this story, and I bet you guys have too, that somebody who went to boot camp came back and they were really good. They, were, they had changed their lives, they had turned things around, and then three months later, they're back to criming. And people are shocked why that happened. But when you take somebody out, and they're allowed to shine out there in the boot camp world, but then you bring them back to that same environment and nothing has changed, those pressures on that young person to conform back to the person they were by their family, by their peers, means that that change is just superficial. That's why we really have moved to that idea that we want to treat kids in their communities and we want to help them figure out how to develop positive peer relationships. We want to help figure out how we can strengthen those families. And we want to give them the tools to exist within the world that they're in rather than removing them because we can't really take everybody out and send them away. All right, other thoughts on things that have changed? Yes, ma'am. I think just in the way that we, um, in like the courtroom, a lot of our judges come down off the bench and they speak with the kids. Instead of being that big, you know, authority figure up on the top, yeah. they're down there like, how can we help you? Um, and I think really individualized treatment as far as like mental health. Um, we have a lot of our sexually exploited children. So just handling them differently than we do everybody else and really getting to the bottom and the, the why of why they're here and finding those treatments that really help them. Right, so we can think about kids are responsible for their behavior. So delinquent behavior, going out there, committing offenses against their communities, that's something they made a choice to do. I'm not saying that because they have trauma in their past that we should excuse that, but if we don't help them figure out how to address those things, then it's likely that they're going to continue that cycle of crime and delinquency and maybe substance use. And they're not going to go out and become the taxpayers that we want them to be, not going to go to college, not going to become part of our communities unless we can help them change their mindset. So I really appreciate that. Yes. Um, also, the, the new terminology of evidence-based practices. Yes. Now, um, that also greater understanding and all of the, the things that you've talked about and that are being discussed in this room, you know, looking at the research, seeing what works, seeing uh, what the best practices are. I think especially our county is, is particularly interested in, in the different areas where evidence-based practices affect juveniles and families and Absolutely. court and supervision and so forth. Yeah, evidence-based practices and this idea that we actually do know what works with kids in a broad, in a broad way is really, really important because I think um, a lot of times when you don't feel like you have that, you kind of bring your own values and you're like, well, if this was my young person, this is how I would want to treat them. Um, and sometimes that means that you're doing what, what happened to you when you were a kid. So that's um, depending on how you grew up, those are the values you bring. And so when we deal with delinquencies, if we don't have that kind of evidence-based practice and we don't have a foundation, then we're kind of shooting blind. And any success that we have then, it's just coincidental. So we can't replicate it. We can't say, oh, here's, here's, this worked with this kid. I'm gonna give that kid this and it's gonna work the same way. We don't know unless we have evidence and then unless we're tracking it. Any other thoughts? All right, so exactly this kind of conversation is why we did, we did our update and went to the Enhanced Juvenile Justice Guidelines. And I wanna take just a minute to tell you about this process for the update. Um, because I asked a lot of the folks that were on my update committee and I think it's important to kind of give them a shout out. I don't list their names or anything, but I want you to know how much work went into changing the um, juvenile justice guidelines. So why did we need to do this? And this is exactly what we just talked about, right? We're using different language. We still have the term mental retardation in our, in our guidelines, the 2003 version. So that was an easy search and replace. Um, so I changed, that was a quick, easy change right off the bat. Um, so there are things that changed in our language and how we approach things that, that we had to make the change to. And I gotta say, I expect this to continue to happen, right? As we think more about this, as we evolve as courts, 
I'm going to have to change it again. But it's nice because now it's online. I'm going to be able to update and change as we go along. And I suspect in five years, we'll have the enhanced, enhanced juvenile justice guidelines. Um, and, and I'll be back here telling you guys all about that. There are new practices in courts. Courts do not operate the same way they did 15 years ago. You guys are doing different things. You're pushing the boundaries. You're experimenting with what is possible in juvenile court. And so we want to make sure that we're reflecting that in the guidelines. We have new recommended practices. We have better evidence-based practices. And we have more that we can tell you about. This is how you run a good juvenile court. And so we wanted to make sure that we had that out there for all of you. We have all of this research. We're so excited about the research that's been done around kids, around delinquency, and around resiliency, right? That idea that kids have inherent strengths and we have an obligation to them to help them build on those strengths and to help them develop those skills that we know they need. And then the Supreme Court rulings. And if nothing else, if all we did was update the guidelines to reference the new Supreme Court rulings, I think it would have been worth it because it really is important that we say that even from the Supreme Court, we're recognizing that kids should not be treated like adults, that young people are not just small adults, that they require different services, that they require different treatment, and that we cannot continue to sentence them to death. We cannot continue to lock them up for life. We cannot continue to put them in solitary confinement. That is inhumane and inappropriate. So we're very happy about that. So it was a long update process. Well, it was a short update process with a lot of work. We had um, just over a year to do the update. And so what I did is I sent to my update committee, and these were all volunteers. Um, I sent them all the guidelines, and I assigned them each a chapter. And they had to update that chapter before they came to our in-person meeting. And so what they were supposed to do is go through and find the things that needed to change. And then we talked about all of the changes at the meeting, and we talked about these larger animating philosophical discussions. And then each, each month, I would make an update to a chapter, and then they'd all have to read it again, get back together with me on an online call, and we'd talk about changes some more. So it just kept going like this. And uh, so it really was important to me that we had that voice from the field, that we had court administrators, that we had judges, that we had prosecutors that we had um, representatives from all of our sister organizations. So we had you know, folks from the Juvenile Defender Center and the National Prosecution Center that were there in the room with us to help inform this. So I just wanna, I wanna tell you that when we did this, it was not just me in a room, that's why I call myself the editor. And honestly, I didn't write a lot of new stuff for the guidelines. It was much more about this idea that we were updating references, that we were updating the content, but it didn't require an entirely new rewrite. So now we're going to talk about the philosophical underpinnings of the Enhanced Juvenile Justice Guidelines. And these are called the key principles. And there's, I think, 16 of them. The key principles existed when we did the delinquency guidelines as well. And it is kind of a cornerstone of all NCJ, FCJ publications and approaches that we have these key principles that we can really boil our work down into. Now, on the app or in the materials that I provided, I actually have a longer version of the key principles than you're going to see today um, because I thought that today it made a better visual to, uh, to go through them in a different way. But there's more information in the materials that I provided to you. So if you want to dig more into this, you have that available to you. So we, we split up our principles. We talk about now fairness, equity, and procedural justice. And those are the key principles that I like to think of as the key principles that have to do with the youth. And then we have the pursuit of excellence, which is everything to do with the court. And, and as we go through them, you'll see what I mean. Um, but there are two different things that you're doing when you're talking about juvenile justice and when you're talking about juvenile justice reform. We're reforming how we work and operate and deal with our young people and their families. But there are also a whole bunch of things that have to happen on the back side of that to make that work. Different ways that we work as court systems, like collaboration, like using data to drive our decision making. And so both of those things need to be present. And all of those things are covered in the guidelines in one way or another. And then we also added two. 
And it was surprising to me that in 2003, we did not have a guideline that talked about equity. That seemed weird, right? DMC has been a thing since forever, but we didn't have, in DMC, if anybody doesn't know, disproportionate minority contact, um, and of course we call it many different things now, but we didn't have anything that said specifically <laughs> that we wanted in our guidelines for juvenile court to encourage courts to be thinking about equity, equity of access to programs and services, and making sure that we're doing everything we can to reduce racial and ethnic disparities. And then we didn't have one on adolescent development, which again is the animating principle behind everything that we do in juvenile court. This idea that kids do not make decisions the same way that adults do. So we added two. Let's go through them. All right, so equity. Equity is our first uh, principle here. And as I said, we know from our data, we know when we look aggregately across courts, that kids of color still, still are going to detention at higher rates than their white peers. We know that they still have less access to services. And sometimes that's geographic, right? Sometimes we put all of our services in a place that our kids can't get to. That means it's not equitable. And that means that it's on us as system professionals, it's on us as caring adults in the community to make sure we're doing something to change that. And so one of our guiding principles then is the idea of equity. We want all kids to have what they need to be successful. And it's on us as the adults to make that happen. Respect. Respect is one of the principles somebody talked about earlier today, that we're going to be respectful of our kids and our parents that come to court. Um, I once was having a, t a talk with somebody who said to me, she said, well, don't you know that coming to court is part of the punishment. Coming to court is part of the punishment because coming to court is a drag, right? A lot of times it's a cattle call situation, so we tell you to show up at 8 o'clock in the morning and maybe we'll talk to you today and maybe we won't, um, that it's hard. You have to sit on uncomfortable chairs and there's lots of people and a lot of times our courtrooms are the oldest courtrooms in the entire city and they're crumbling and hot and terrible and that's part of the punishment. You shouldn't have shoplifted if you didn't want to do this. You, sh you shouldn't have been out there with your, your spray can and doing your graffiti if you didn't want to have to sit in hot court all day, right? And so if we have that mindset that this is something that folks deserve, then we're losing that respect. I love to watch court. And I watch court, I see about, oh, 30 or 40 courts a year. So it's, it's one of my favorite things to come out and watch court. Um, and I love to watch court and I love to watch judges from the bench um, embody this idea of respect. They will often greet everyone by name um, as they come up, especially on those dockets where kids are coming back maybe multiple times. Uh, they're always kind to the parents. Um, in some courts, I've seen that the judge does kind of some announcements at the beginning of court about um, activities and things that are going on in the community in case any of the people who are in there are interested in participating in them. And then, as we talked about, we have lots of judges now that are, if not coming off the bench, really thinking a lot more about this judicial demeanor and how they can be a force for good in the lives of those young people. Um, you know that our kids are looking for folks to look up to. And what better person to look up to than a judge? And the best way to get that interaction to happen is that respect, that idea that this person who holds a, uh, an important position in my community is coming and talking to me like an equal, or at least like somebody he respects or she respects. That's really, really important to our kids, and it's really important to our parents. And if we want them to engage in services, if we want them to take advantage of all these great things that you have to offer, this is a great way to start, offering respect. Diversion, we talked about this. We want in our guidelines to divert kids that don't need to be in court. And we want to use valid screening and assessment to do so. Um, how many of you guys are using a risk need assessment tool in your court? Yeah? OK, so I want folks to shout out what tools you're using. Like, you were using the PACT, but now you're moving to something new Florida-based yeah. thing. OK, Lionel, what are you using? What are you using in your court? 
Use the mic. We're using the PACT also. PACT, okay, yeah. PSRA. PSRA, yeah, absolutely. So the good thing about these instruments, and there is, you know, there are some things that aren't perfect yet, right? We don't have perfect, perfect bulletproof instruments. There is some bias that's a little bit baked into some of these. But the best thing about them is that they tell us what kids are low risk of continuing to commit crime. Low risk kids are perfect for diversion or just being dismissed, right? That's the kid that gets into trouble, his parents freak out, they rally around and they don't need us. They don't need court. They don't need the interventions that we have to offer because they've got lots of other supports. They're the kids that are already really active maybe in their communities. Maybe they're on a sport team and they're gonna not get to play for a couple of games. There's already things that are happening in their lives that are gonna help address that delinquent behavior, right? So those are not the kids that are going to continue in their career of criminality. And what we know when we look at our risk need assessments is there are kind of three big reasons that kids are criming. It's, uh, and they're called different things in different instruments, but basically criminogenic thinking, negative peer associations, and nothing to do, also known as leisure time, right? And so for that criminogenic thinking kid, that's the kid that's thinking it's him against you. It's the kid that is excited to commit crime, right? It's fun. It's great to get something over on people. They don't even mind a little bit of maybe, you know, uh, light harm to other people. They don't mind pulling a gun on somebody maybe because they have this criminogenic thinking. They think about their role in society differently than we want them to. We have to address that if we're gonna help them not commit crime. We can't just say, go sit in a detention cell for, for 20 days. That doesn't help them not commit crime. That just helps them think up new ways to commit crime and make new friends. The negative peer association kid is the kid sitting next to them who's like, I don't have anything else to do. Sure, I'll go and help you rob the 7-Eleven, right? That's the kid that's just going along with the other kids. They're not gonna benefit from going to detention either because they're gonna meet better criminals and they're gonna develop these skills, right? And then we have that leisure time kid. And that's the kid who just doesn't have enough to do. So let's get that kid busy, right? Those things are what drive juvenile crime. And now second tier things that help drive juvenile crime are things like family, things like substance use, but those are not the actual drivers of crime. It's those big three usually when you do your, your assessments that come up. So what are we doing to address those things? How are we helping solve those challenges? And then how do we give them additional services for things like trauma, for other issues? That's what we're thinking about when we're thinking about using our screening and assessment tools. And for the most part, it's helping us identify those kids that we can divert. Legal representation. Somebody here mentioned it earlier that every single kid who comes to court should have an attorney. Every single kid. And that attorney should be paid. We want adequately compensated representation for our kids. And it's hard, right? There's kind of a shortage of people who want to be defense attorneys anyway. And then to be defense attorney for a 16-year-old, it's kind of kind of a hard lift for folks. And so in your communities, there's opportunities, I think, to grow this pool of people who you can call on. Now, are all of your kids represented by attorneys in your courts? Yes, yes, mostly? Right on, okay. See, this is permeate, permeating. Consideration of crime victims. We haven't talked a lot about victims of crime um, during this presentation so far. And it's really important when we think about juvenile crime that we think about victims of crime because often the victims of juvenile crime are members of the community. A lot of times it's other kids, right? That can set up some domino effect that we don't want. Sometimes it's family members. And so we have to be thoughtful about victims of crime and make sure that we're giving them all due consideration that they deserve. Um, that means that we wanna have separate waiting areas for, um, for the kids who are committing delinquent acts and for the victims of crime. So that we have um, something where the victims feel safe. We wanna make sure that they have a voice in the proceedings. And I'll tell you, one of the things that the guidelines recommends and that juvenile justice reform recommends overall is eliminating fines and fees for kids. So that means that we're gonna get rid of this idea that we can make victims whole by giving them restitution. If we do that, 
what are we going to do instead? How do we help our victims feel like they have been made whole in some way? And you probably have heard about balanced and restorative justice, right? This idea that um, it's important for kids to give back to the people who they've harmed. So how do we do that? How do we help them do that in a way that uh, is, is healthy and a way that's um, in consideration of the victims of crime? Not just community service, although I like community service. Timely, we talked about timely already. Um, kids, kids are very short-term thinkers. Uh, so we need to make sure things are very timely. We want to make sure that as much as we can, things are proceeding apace, right? That whatever is going to happen happens as quickly as possible. And when we go into the, if you go into the actual guidelines, there are actually recommendations about timelines. Um, and I know there are national recommendations now about timelines for how long you can hold youth in detention while you're waiting to get them in front of a judge. And that's 48 hours, right? So. We want to get kids in front of judges and get them settled where they're going to be, at least initially, as quickly as possible. Engage families. So we talked about how this idea that all of our kids exist in this system that we cannot control. They go to schools with their peers where they have lots of opportunities to commit crime and get up to no good. They go home to families, and sometimes we feel like our families are part of the problem, right? that we feel like if they only parented their kids better, they wouldn't be in this mess. But I gotta tell you, we gotta think about our families in a different way. Sure, they've got challenges. Possibly they did contribute to this mess, but if we want to change the trajectory of that young person, we have to help strengthen that family unit, right? That has to happen. Otherwise, we can't always be there to provide support, right? We're not always gonna be there to send that young person to jail when he talks back to his mom. So that means we got to think about how we're going to help families become stronger, help parents um, whenever possible, giving parents services that they need. And when we think about engaging, it's really going to where the parents are and asking them, how can we work together? We're on the same team. You want the same outcomes. You want these kids to be successful adults. So how can we work together to achieve that end? Then we want to engage schools and other community uh, resources. So we've spent a lot of time at the National Council just lately talking about the school to prison pipeline and the idea that our schools are uh, under a lot of pressure, right? They've got a lot of different things that are happening for them. Uh, a lot of times they feel underfunded um, and unprepared to deal with juvenile delinquency. Um, and so a lot of crime happens on school grounds and it was easy for schools to just send those kids to, to juvenile court, right? To say, you're not our problem anymore, off you go, the court will handle it. And so we got better at handling those kids in our court system, right? We, we have much better like school in detention. Um, have you guys, you guys go to your detention facilities? Yeah? They show you the classroom, you get to meet the three accredited teachers that are there. And they'll tell you about how there's no loss of work for those kids that are going to detention because we're going right from school and then the very next day they're in our classroom. We've already gotten the information from the school and they're right on track. We're not going to have any loss of learning if, you have to, if kids have to go to detention. So that's how we compensated when, when our school started to send us all of the kids in, into uh, to juvenile justice. We just got better at teaching the kids while they were in juvenile justice. Our research from 10 years ago or so was showing us that Kids that go to detention have terrible school outcomes, and it was because of this gap. But we didn't say, how can we keep our kids in school? We just said, how can we bring the school to our kids? And so that fixed the problem, sorta, but we still had schools that were feeling this pressure. Now what we wanna do is we wanna go with the school, we wanna talk to the schools, and we wanna be like, how can we support you in keeping our kids here, in their communities, being successful in school? So we got to engage with our schools. And then other community resources. There are lots of resources in most communities, even really, really small um, rural communities have more resources than they think. And one of the things I've got to say I am so impressed with that I've seen happen in the last 10 years in juvenile justice is you guys as court administrators really spending a lot of time making these connections. I, I don't go places anymore where they say, we, can't, we don't have any place to put those kids. Uh, we don't have any services. I was in Winnemucca, Nevada, 
which is um, up on highway or um, I-80, Interstate 80, of uh, 700 or so miles north of here. And it's a, it's a town of about 20,000 people and it's just right on the interstate and that's all there is, is the interstate and some mining. And they had this beautiful um, family centered, uh, family center <laughs> that, and they had um, these nice interview rooms. They had places where kids could go to talk with their counselor. They had places where kids could go to talk with their families and it was just really nicely set up. They had a whole um, closet full of things for kids and families who might need it that had been donated by their community. And they had all these folks that were there willing to help. And so even in the smallest of places, we have more and better resources. And it's because of work that you guys have done to say, what can we, what can we do? What do our kids and families need? And so I think that's really amazing. And I hope to, to continue to watch that flourish. Individualize. We talked about this a lot earlier, where our kids are, each, each one of them, a special snowflake. This idea that we need to figure out what helps that young person change. And when I talk to probation officers, I talk a ton about case management and about the idea that probation officers really need to work with that young person to actually set goals so that we're not just compliance monitoring. We're not just, did you go to your meeting? Did you come to see me? Did you drop your UA, right? Did you show up to school? It shouldn't be a checklist. It should be working with that young person to set goals. And so however we can do that, and I know that a lot of the risk need assessment software has that built in, that case management piece, but I also know it's a little bit clunky and maybe sometimes hard to use. So as court administrators, you guys have an opportunity, I think, to work with uh, your probation folks to figure out how we can get good case planning and help kids set goals and reach goals rather than just do what we tell them to do. Adolescent development. So I was thinking about adolescent development and uh, I bet we could all tell stories. Uh, I know I have told stories about when I was a kid and the bad decisions I made. But uh, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about this news story, and you guys probably saw this news story. About two weeks ago, a young woman walked into a Walmart, took the lid off of a container of ice cream. She was sick, she licked the ice cream. She filmed herself doing this and she said, you know, let's, uh, let's make the contagion go viral or something, right? So she implied that she wanted to infect other people with her sickness. Um, she filmed herself doing this, so clearly this was not a spur of the moment decision, right? So this is the adolescent brain exactly in microcosm. She spent time thinking about doing this, did not think about the long-term consequences, didn't think about how it might affect somebody to open up an ice cream that's been licked. She didn't think about anything but kind of herself, right? That idea that this was gonna be fun and funny and people would admire her for having done it and she would get you know, some praise and she'd be in the spotlight. Those are all things that animate kids. She would get a lot of peer respect. And so that is an example of a terrible adolescent decision. So when that young person comes to court, what are we gonna do with her? How are we gonna help her figure out that she's not supposed to do that? And certainly in this young woman's case, it looked like her, her parents were aghast that she had done this and there was a lot of community outcry. And so in some ways, the lesson has already been learned, right? That she's like, oh, I shouldn't do that. So when she's in court, what do we do? Well, we should think about what her risk and her need is and then we should help her figure out how she can give back to the community that she has now damaged. She has breached that trust in a big way. So what do we do to help her feel like she can repair that damage to the community? So that's what we want to do when we think about adolescent development. It's not just getting that kids make dumb decisions, because they do. It's a normal part of the adolescent brain. And it's great, right? When you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, they'll be smart, they'll say great things, they'll tell you about goals in the future, and then they still do things like that, because the brain is still developing. So it's our job then, when we think about outcomes, to think about what those outcomes should look like and how we can help young people change that thinking. All right, let's talk about the pursuit of excellence. And this is the part that I think is, is particularly of, of uh, interest to you guys. 
So in the pursuit of excellence, we want to have judicial leadership. The National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges believes very strongly in the idea that judges should be the driving force for change in their communities. We want judges to come off of the bench and be leaders in their communities, and we want them to do so within their ethical canons and guidelines, but that it really is important for judges to be the leaders in these things, because when a judge calls, everybody shows up. Nobody says, oh no judge, I'm not coming to that. No, people come. Judges have a power there. They have power of the convener. And so I encourage all of you, don't tell your judges I said this. No, I'm kidding. I encourage all of you to use that power of your judge. So if you're trying to make change and you wanna really get folks behind it, get the judge on board, get them out there, get them making the phone calls to bring people to the table because they really do have that power and they can really drive things. Now I know also that then judges that do that often put more work on your plate. Um, and I apologize for that. Adequate staff, resources, and facilities. Oh my gosh, aren't you tired of juvenile court being like the last thing on the budget and then being like, oh yeah, I guess, right? Like juvenile court is the practice court. That's what some people think of it as. They think of, of juvenile court as being uh, the least in need of resources. Um, the least high profile, but really our courts need to have adequate, they need to have exemplary um, staffing, funding, and facilities because that's really, if you think about it, most people who come to court are either coming to traffic court or they're coming, coming to a family court. They're coming to a juvenile or family court. They're coming to get divorced. They're coming for child custody. They're coming because their kid got in trouble. This is the most people ever see of court usually is our courts. And so we should have the same resources um, as, our, as our big brothers. So at the National Council, we believe in this idea of one family, one judge. And it is controversial. It's hard to pull off, right? So some states, this works just fine in your statutes. Some states, it does not. And sometimes, I mean, I think we have a lot of evidence that we feel like this is a successful thing. But there is a reasonable amount of evidence to say, actually, there's some good reasons not to do it. So what I'll tell you is that we recommend that you try for coordinated case processing wherever you can. If you have kids and families that are participating in both child welfare court and juvenile delinquency court, try to make it easy for them. So they don't come on Tuesday to deal with child welfare issues and then come back to the court on Thursday to deal with juvenile delinquency issues. As much as you can, try to think about that court user experience. Think about how the people that are coming to court are experiencing your court. And that's really gonna be a great first step if you can't get all the way to one judge, one family. And the one judge, one family really is what it says, that a judge would take under their umbrella all of those different cases that are related to that family because they know that family. And I know that um, when I, when I talk to courts and when I go out and I talk to judges, they often know the family before they've come to court because that's just a family that's causing a ruckus out in the community, right? Or, oh yeah, we've had his older brother and his older sister and his two cousins, so not a surprise to see him here too, right? So thinking about how we can use that, um, that leverage to make sure we're getting good services for our kids and families is important. Status. So the status of the juvenile court is something that's really important to our juvenile and family court judges. Because this idea that it's just juvie court, that it's where we stick all the new judges because it's not that important anyway, um, is, is absurd, right? You guys know, you work in, in juvenile court. Because what we know is that these cases are actually more complicated. We have less settled case law for juvenile and family court than we do trial court uh, like murder trials, there's a lot of precedents and a lot of things where you have to just follow the rules. We have a lot more discretion in juvenile and family courts. So we should have the same status as any other court. Accountability. We want courts to hold themselves accountable. We want judges to hold court staff accountable. We want court staff to hold judges accountable. Judges should be holding themselves accountable. And not every juvenile and family court judge is a good judge. Most of them are 
but not everybody. And so we need to always be thinking about accountability. How are we holding our system accountable? When things go wrong, what are we doing about it? Is there a post-mortem to take about what happened? Or do we just say, this is a one-off and we don't have to worry? What do we do? How are we holding ourselves accountable? Information systems. And, <laughs> and this is adequately funded and appropriate for your needs uh, when we say information systems. So data is a big deal, right? I bet you guys spend a lot of your time looking at data, looking at numbers, because those things drive a lot of your budget, right? If your juvenile cases are down, maybe they're gonna cut your budget by 20%. Um, and so you need to have your MIS system, but you need an MIS system that works for you. And so when we think about courts of excellence, we want courts of excellence to have MIS systems that actually can give you the information you need to do your jobs. And then we want you to collect this data and we actually want you to look at it. I want court administrators and judges to be sitting down looking at outcomes for kids, looking at how quickly kids are moving through the system. When we think about timely, how do you know if you're timely or not? Well, you keep track and you go back and you say, did we do this in the time that we thought we were gonna do it? And if cases are getting stuck somewhere, what are you doing about that? Can you do something about that? So we need to have the data to tell us. And then we really encourage post-dispositional review. And this is part of that accountability um, and part of that, that data piece as well, which is that once you're done, once that young person has moved through the system and you send them back out into the world, what are you doing to say, did we do what we said we were gonna do? Did things change? Uh, one of the things I think is great about our risk need assessments is that we can actually reassess. So theoretically, if a young person completes a program under your watchful eye, you should be able to reassess them and say, oh, they went from moderate risk to low risk. We have done our jobs and you can feel good about it, right? That's a great data point. But it's hard to reassess and we don't always do it. Post-dispositional review gives you and your judge a chance to really look at what happened and make sure that you're holding yourselves accountable, make sure that cases are working the way they should. And this should be done then for kind of a random sampling of cases, not, not every case, and not just the cases where something went wrong. Did I have one more that came up? Training. Training. <laughs> I was like, I think there's one more. Training, well, you guys know that, you're already here. Um, so we really think that it's vitally important for every single person in the juvenile court system to be adequately trained about their job, about juvenile court, about adolescent development, about trauma, about evidence-based practices. Ideally, I'd love it if everybody got trained on motivational interviewing, <laughs> family engagement. These are big deals that we want our courts, all the court staff to get trained on. And uh, I'll make another plug to say that the National Council does have some resources to help train your courts. Um, so do think about reaching out to us um, and to see if we have something. I will tell you also that the Enhanced Juvenile Justice Guidelines will, in 2020, be looking for courts that um, want to be model courts, want to experiment with me and help me develop more and better tools for this project. So uh, think about applying to join me in a grand experiment. So let's talk about the changes to the guidelines themselves. So the most important change is that we change the language. We don't call them delinquency guidelines anymore. We call them juvenile justice guidelines. We tried to remove the term delinquent as much as we could as well. Now it just says youth. We remove terms that are no longer used and we added new language, particularly around sexual orientation and gender identity. And what I really like about the guidelines as they are now, because they're online, I have a little section about uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, but then I have a link to a whole bunch of other things. The National Juvenile Defender Center and the National Council, we got together and we created a little bench book for how to work with SOGI kids, that sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. That's what SOGI stands for. So we have a bench book. It's two pages. It's a front side and a back side that talks about what to do with kids who come to court who may be transgender, uh, how to deal with kids who are gay, lesbian, 
um, and transgender in detention settings, which can be hard. Um, we didn't talk about drug testing for, for transgender kids, but I have another link to a different re resource about that. So what's cool about it being online is that you guys can use this as this one-stop shop. You can come to my website, you can look at the little brief introduction I have to it, and then if you want more, you can click on those things and find those things. And what I'm hoping to do with the next iteration is even create more of that. So maybe there's some downloadable like worksheets that you can use to do things. Um, I have actually a great MOU worksheet that I created for a different project that I'm just gonna move on over here so that if you wanna do an MOU, you'll have a step-by-step -step instruction for how to do that. So here are the changes in practice that really we wanted to reflect within the guidelines. We really want risk, need, and responsivity to drive all decisions in court. And we don't want you just to do this and then put it in the, the file. We actually want this to be a document that is used, that is talked about, that your probation officers are using to make case planning decisions, that they're using to make goals, help our young people set goals and achieve goals. We want to make sure that you're using this to divert kids. And I want you to be looking at this data again regularly to have a picture of those kids that are coming to your court. I should be able to call up any one of you and say, hey, give me your risk profile for your kids. And you would be able to say, oh, Jessica, last year we did 137 packs and 70% uh, of those kids were low risk, 20% were moderate risk and 10% were high risk. And here's how they all got funneled out. That's what I want. I think that would be really helpful. Then I can say to you, cool, let's talk more about your data and how I can help you use it to change your practice. We want to increase the use of diversion programs, which we talked about, and we want to really reduce the use of detention. So there are three reasons we use detention. You guys know what our three reasons for using detention are? I'll let you just shout, yes, ma'am. Prevent harm, yeah. So if a kid is a danger to themselves or to their community, we, want, we are gonna think about using detention. What's our last one? Failure, well not failure to come to court, but if they abscond, yeah. If they take off, detention might be an appropriate use. What I tell people all the time is I want you to not use the same response for a kid talking back to the judge that you would use for the kid holding a knife on the judge. That doesn't make any sense. If you use the talking, if you use detention for a kid talking back to the judge, what in the world are you gonna do if you have a kid that does do something like pull a knife on court staff? That puts you in this position where you've already used your big, your big hammer, and that kid didn't need it. He was just being an adolescent, being mouthy. And so what do we do? So we've gotta really concentrate. And as court, court administrators, you guys know, detention is the most expensive thing we can do with a kid anyway. Right? So why would we want to use our money and our resources if we don't have to? And then we have changes in the way that cases are dismissed and processed. Um, do all of you automatically seal juvenile records? You know, that didn't used to always be. So you don't? They're not sealed. Right. So, and that's that's the way it used to be everywhere. That that um, some were sealed, some were not. We could sometimes use completion of some programs to expunge. Uh, that used to be the big carrot for like drug courts. Come to the juvenile drug court, and we'll expunge your record. But now it's kind of just become this movement around the country that we just expunge records as a matter of course. And so when that happens. Well, that means we got to talk about different ways that we're, we're processing and dismissing cases. Um, a lot of cases uh, are being dismissed um, administratively without that kind of coming back to court and being officially released from detention, or not detention, from probation. So a lot of different things are happening that we wanted to reflect in the guidelines. So changes in recommended practice. Are you guys still using fines and fees? Yeah. So this is a huge movement right now, the reduction of fines and fees for kids and the reduction of cash bail for adults, right? So why do we wanna do this? 
Lionel, can you bring the microphone? Why do we want to not use fines and fees for kids? So I've got a hand here. One of the main reasons is inability to pay. So you're keeping them in the system because they, they simply can't pay, and that's not helping the child. Um, there's other ways that they, they can do community service. They can write reports. They can do research. There's other things that they can do to complete their case if there's no ability to pay. Absolutely. We'd like all kids to be declared indigent for the purposes of being in court because they don't make their own money, or at least some of them don't. All right, yes. Um, shackling of youth. So this is a recommendation I make all the time to my judges, and they say, I'd really love to not shackle kids, but my sheriff's department is really uncomfortable. So we got to really work with our law enforcement friends and help come up with a plan for where we can feel comfortable not shackling kids. We know that this is a psychological harm. We know that this causes additional trauma, not only to the young person and their family, but also think about all of those other people that are there witnessing that. Um, the kids that come shuffling in in their belly chain and the big, uh, big ankles and the, the wrists, and they're coming in because they were smoking marijuana. This does not feel proportional that we have kids that are in that situation for smoking marijuana, right? We gotta think about proportionality the same way we do with the tension. I understand if some sheriff's offices are uncomfortable with the idea of not shackling kids, but in most cases, they have adequate courtroom security to handle it. And so we always tell our judges that this is one of those issues where they need to be on the forefront out there talking about why this is okay and making those conversations. So if you have a judge that's doing that, I would encourage you to, um, to call me. We have actually resources about this. We have a bunch of uh, research around shackling that we can help um, animate that conversation for you. We have changes in thinking about privacy, and we talked a little bit about this already, that juvenile court used to be closed, then it was open, and now we kind of are doing this hybrid for a lot of juvenile court systems. And so how can we make sure that you have the adequate recommendations you need for that? Those are in the guidelines. So it's really great, all of our detention um, alternatives that have happened. Uh, the NEE Casey Foundation had the Ju Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, and they've done a marvelous job of reducing the number of kids in detention. Tons of kids no longer in detention, but still, kids of color are more likely to be in detention than their white peers. And so we want to make sure that uh, we're doing something about that. And what's happened is it's, it's a proportional thing. So less kids of color are in detention, but proportionally, more of them are than should be. This is how my uh, Melissa Sickman, who works at, the, who runs our National Center for Juvenile Justice, this is how she explains it to me. And she, so I said to her, I was like, so the answer really is to lock up more white kids. And she, she said, yeah, like, well, no, but that's what, that's the proportionality is off. And so we have to really think about um, what we're doing and look at our data and make this a goal. We actually have a publication that's coming out probably at the end of the year that'll talk about looking at that data and setting goals for reducing uh, disparities in court. And then again, I talked a little bit about our recommendations for gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and gender nonconforming youth. Um, these kids are much more likely to be victimized, and they're much less likely to be the perpetrators of things. But the way things get charged and the way kids get picked up, we end up with some of these kids that are coming into our system. When we send them to detention, they get victimized there. And when we're not giving them adequate supports and services, then we further victimize and create trauma and harm. And so we gotta be really, really thoughtful about how we're dealing with these kids. So we have better, better information about why kids commit crime and how we can address that crime. Our section on risk, need, and responsivity is another one of those where I have four paragraphs that describe the tools, and then I have links to a bunch of things, including all of the work that uh, Dr. Gina Vincent did. She's kind of the person for understanding risk and need. She helped me write the section in the, the guidelines, and then she went through and, uh, and gave me all of these resources. So if you go to that part of the website, 
you'll get everything you ever wanted to know about risk, need, and responsivity instruments and how to use them. And then I had um, Dr. Joe Haas, who works up in Washoe County, um, here in, in Reno, Nevada, and he actually provided us with this sort of use case for how to think about trauma and delinquency and how understanding trauma isn't a driver of delinquency, but also is something that we have an obligation to help address in our young people because we know that it's there and we have an obligation to not only address it, but not further traumatize kids. Adolescent development and adolescent recidivism also are big parts of the update. And then finally, if nothing else, I have these great three Supreme Court rulings that I got to add to our list of references. Um, these are about uh, death penalty for kids, lifetime incarceration, and solitary confinement. I've talked a lot about how it's online. I'm so excited, you guys. It's so cool. Um, and I really want to create a lot more tools and resources. So if you decide that you'd like to um, become one of my model courts and experiment with me, one of the things that I'm really going to be asking the courts to do is tell me what they need to adequately implement these guidelines. Because as I said before, our job as training and technical assistance providers is to make your jobs easier. So I need to know what things look like in the real world. Because I can talk about this theoretically all I want, right? I can say, don't shackle. And then I can sit in the meeting with your sheriff's department who says, oh yeah, we're shackling. And OK, I can't do anything about that. Here's some literature. Won't you read it? Um, and so I understand that there's this real world challenge that you have when you're implementing things like the guidelines. I need courts to work with me to tell me where the challenges are and to help me think about how we can overcome those challenges. What tools, research, resources, and research do you need to do this? All right, so for our last, yes, sir. Does, uh, you maybe will get to this, and I apologize. Wow, I don't know if I need this, but um, maybe you'll get to this. But I wonder if the, if the guidelines talk at all about um, jurisdiction, so to speak. So in our in our jurisdiction, there's a really big push to raise the age again. Yeah. We Are just you had in New York? Some, Massachusetts. Massachusetts, okay. We yeah. just had some reform passed um, within the last year or so that also brought the floor up. So under 12 year old, that you have to be 12 to be charged at all, um, and that's created some some issues as well. So sure. do, is, do, does you address any of that? We do. And um, the raise the age is a really interesting movement. So in some states, we had uh, the age of majority basically for the purposes of court was 16. Um, that's places like New York, North Carolina. And uh, so there was a raise the age movement to help those states move to 18. But then other states like Washington State and Oregon were, started to say, well, heck, we know all this stuff about the adolescent brain. We don't let people draw or drink until they're 21. Rental car companies won't rent to kids until they're 25. So let's maybe raise the age past 18 even, and can we keep ju juvenile jurisdiction until 21, uh, 25? I, I've heard 25. I think that's that's a reach, right? <laughs> like how? But the idea is that we would even. Right now, you can retain jurisdiction if a young person is already in your system, right? Past the age of, of 18. Sometimes it's to 19. Sometimes it's to 20, 21. But they actually want to say, if you're 20 and you commit a crime, you'd still come to juvenile court. Because we know that your brain works like an adolescent brain still. We know that you're more likely to get the resources and services you need if you come. And uh, so that's what we'd like to do that. So we do touch on it in the guidelines. I don't have a good recommendation for you, though, um, because nobody's really done it, so I don't have a great use case. Um, I can talk about outcomes for kids who are retained um, past the age of 18 because they've already committed a crime and they're already under the jurisdiction. But like for kids coming in at those older ages, I think it's really interesting. That emerging adult population is, is really, I think, where we're going to see courts go. And that comes to my question on the screen. I think that it's very possible that we'll see a carve out for those kids um, that are 18 to 21, 22, because we're feeling like they need something different than they're getting in adult court, probably something different than they get in juvenile court too. So what are we gonna do to help those kids? All right, I have five minutes left, so I'm gonna open it up for questions. All 
All right, then if nobody has questions, I'm going to ask you to answer my question. What do you think the future of uh, juvenile justice looks like besides raising the age? Yes, ma'am. Lionel's coming with the microphone. I think as research continues to grow and, and we continue to do these model courts that juvenile justice will look more like a specialty court, that there is going to be more services, we're going to, to provide more um, social services, basically. Yeah, more social services, more wraparound. Courts. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, over here. I think it's going to move more from out of home placement and um, secure care to more maybe in home ways of um, keeping a child at home or detaining them there. Absolutely. And we know when we think about services that those family services, those family treatment models, the functional family therapy, uh, the multidimensional family therapy, we know those have really, really good outcomes, but they're pricey. So what do we do? But I think you're totally right. We're going to move more toward that. I think we already talked about this, but I think we've seen um, a real reduction in the amount of cases that are actually coming because of all the things we're talking about, diversion before yep. the case even, you know, just not even bringing youths into court. So I think, I think the future will probably be more of that, and you'll see if it's the way it works the way it should, the, just the more serious cases develop into, into the court setting. I totally agree, and I think that the, re the reduction of crime across the board and all of the different kind of theories about why that is, um, is really fascinating. So one of the reasons why the, the researchers are feeling like there's less crime is partly because there's less lead paint, and lead paint really does do a number on your brain, and, and that created more crime. Uh, also, because we have our cell phones, we have less personal contact now, which is actually leading to less crime, right? A lot more people are Venmoing their drug dealers than giving them cash in a paper bag, and that's reducing crime. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on around this idea of crime reduction that is just fascinating. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, I'd say Google it. It's fun. All right. Um, any one, one more thought, anybody? I'll say that I think that um, we're starting to swim more upstream, and I think the point about engaging schools uh, with juvenile court is going to be a, a conversation that, that uh, really increases talking about reform with school discipline and uh, even before school, how do we engage families early on to, to get in, engaged in the child's life. Absolutely. And working together, that idea that we can collaborate with our school districts so that they're not just saying, eh, take the kids, we're scared, or take the kids, we're overwhelmed. And instead, we're working together to create um, better outcomes, I think is really important. All right, that is our time. You guys have been a wonderful audience. I appreciate all the participation. Thank you to our virtual audience. I hope it was interesting for you as well. And uh, let's give Jessica a hand. Uh -huh.